Thank you for joining us for identifying threats from virus diseases in watermelon and other cucurbit crops. This presentation was originally presented as a webinar on May 13, 2020, hosted by the Mississippi State University Extension Service, the Alabama Cooperative Extension System with Auburn University, the Louisiana State University Agricultural Center, and the United States Department of Agriculture's Agriculture Research Service. The webinar was offered and this video is being made available as part of a project funded by the National Watermelon Association. My name is Rebecca Malonson. I am an assistant extension professor and extension plant pathologist with the Mississippi State University Extension Service. During the webinar, I was joined by panelists and project collaborators Ed Sakura, professor and extension plant pathologist with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System and Auburn University, and Raj Singh, associate professor and director of the Plant Diagnostic Center with the Louisiana State University Agricultural Center, as well as our presenter, Bill Wintermantle, with the United States Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Research Service, who will now take over to begin his presentation. Thank you, Rebecca. Today we will talk about identifying threats to cucurbit production from whitefly transmitted viruses. Cucurbit crops include watermelon, melon, including cantaloupe, honeydew, and other types of melons, squash, pumpkin, and other related plants such as gourds or loofah. Cucurbit crops are impacted by many virus diseases, and some of the most severe are those transmitted by whiteflies. In my presentation today, I will introduce you to several viruses of cucurbit crops transmitted by whitefly, provide information on concerns relevant to agriculture, and introduce information on how we identify and differentiate infections caused by these different viruses. Insect transmitted viruses can be devastating to agriculture, and white flies are some of the most notorious and damaging insect pests throughout the world. This slide presents several means by which white flies impact agriculture. In the upper right is a tomato plant infected by tomato yellow leaf curl virus, one of the most well-known and devastating diseases of tomato globally, and a problem for production in the southeastern United States as well as the Caribbean. The disease is transmitted by the whitefly, Bemisia tabassi, shown in the center, commonly known as the sweet potato whitefly. This whitefly transmits viruses that cause disease in many crops. In the lower right, is a cassava leaf covered in whitefly nymphs, or immature whiteflies. A different biotype of Amesia tabassi transmits virus diseases that have devastated cassava production in sub-Saharan Africa. Sweet potato virus disease, shown in the lower center, is caused by a mixed infection of two different viruses, one of which is transmitted by the sweet potato whitefly. In the upper left, you can see a melon plant with the bottoms of leaves covered by whiteflies. Believe it or not, this is a typical number of whiteflies in the Imperial Valley of Southern California in the late summer and fall. The sheer number of whiteflies can lead to loss of plants due to feeding damage alone, as shown in the photo in the lower left. Disease development requires the presence of a virulent pathogen, a susceptible host, and favorable environmental conditions. Plant pathologists call this the disease triangle. Any given disease can only develop when all three conditions are met. However, if any one of the conditions is absent, the disease will not develop. Let's translate the disease triangle into a real situation involving plant viruses. For example, a virus needs a mode of introduction into a new region. This can happen through movement of insects carrying virus into the area through natural events such as storms or through human activities like import of infected transplants into a new region. Once introduced, the virus needs a viable vector to spread and establish. A vector is what transmits the virus, much like a mosquito is a vector of West Nile virus or malaria. Other types of organisms spread plant viruses, and this can include insects, fungi, nematodes, or even in some cases, depending on the virus, movement of water or human activities. If a vector is not present, the virus will not establish. There also must be an available host plant, either a crop, local weeds, or both, in which the virus can establish and from which the vector will feed efficiently enough to acquire and transmit the virus further. 
Finally, environmental factors can influence the development as well. Generally, this is focused on weather factors that may influence host plants or vector prevalence, but may also include things like the use or effectiveness of control methods. Two major whitefly genera are responsible for most plant virus transmission throughout the world. The Mesia tabassi, shown on the right, is globally distributed in tropical and subtropical areas, and in greenhouse facilities in some temperate areas as well. The greenhouse whitefly, Triodorotes vaporariorum, is common in warmer temperate regions or in subtropical regions during cooler seasons as well as greenhouses. The banded wing whitefly, Triodorotes abutilonia, is another important but less well-known vector. It is present in the central and southern United States as well as periodically in the desert southwest. These are also important vectors of plant viruses. The type of whitefly will influence what can be transmitted. There are over 37 biotypes of Bermesia tabassi that have been identified to date. These are morphologically indistinguishable within species variants and entomologists also refer to them as cryptic species, but I'll use the term biotype for this presentation. Three of these biotypes are important in the United States. The A biotype, the original sweet potato whitefly, is a new world whitefly that was prevalent in the southwestern United States in the 1980s, where it was, in where it was notorious for spreading lettuce infectious yellows virus, a precursor to some of the yellowing viruses we have today. The A biotype was completely displaced from the region over a period of about 18 months in the early 1990s by the B biotype, which to this day is the most prevalent and agriculturally important whitefly vector of viruses in the United States as well as much of the world. The B biotype, although now also called the sweet potato whitefly, is also known as the silverleaf whitefly for the silver coloration it causes on leaves of squash plants on which it feeds. A new whitefly, the Q biotype is emerging in some places, not only in the United States, but also in other parts of the world. The Q biotype transmits many of the same viruses as the B biotype, with similar efficiency, it appears, but is far more capable of adapting to overcome insecticides. There are many whitefly transmitted viruses that cause disease on cucurbit crops in the United States. Many cause yellowing of leaves, and we'll talk about those a lot more. Most have strange acronyms, but once you hear the names, you'll appreciate the acronyms a lot more. In this slide, you see three viruses with nearly identical symptoms of intervenal yellowing, or yellowing between the veins. Cucurbit yellow stunting disorder virus, or CYSDV, shown in the upper left. Cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus, or CCYV, shown in the center left. And beet pseudo yellows virus, or BPYV, shown in the lower center all produce similar symptoms. Other viruses may show symptoms like vein clearing or leaf crumpling and yellowing, as shown in some of the other photos. All of these viruses on this page are transmitted by whiteflies. They can be transmitted by small populations or by large populations, as can be found in the desert, where whiteflies can look like fog or snow over a field, as shown in the lower right-hand photograph taken in the Imperial Valley of California. There are three main categories that virologists put viruses into based on the nature of their transmission. These are called persistent, semi-persistent, and non-persistent. Persistent transmission lasts for the life of the insect. Virus particles are ingested, move into the gut of the insect, through the gut wall into the hemolymph or blood of the insect, and then circulate to the salivary glands. Viruses in this category include those transmitted by both whiteflies and aphids. Non-persistent transmission only lasts for periods ranging from a few minutes to a few hours. In this type of transmission, virus particles briefly associate with the lining of the insect's stylet or foregut and are released during probing or feeding. To the best of my knowledge, no whitefly transmitted viruses are classified as non-persistent, but this category does include several well-known viruses such as cucumber mosaic virus and the potiviruses, watermelon mosaic virus, zucchini yellow mosaic virus, and papaya ring spot virus. Semi-persistent transmission makes up a broad category covering pretty much everything in between persistent and non-persistent. This type of transmission usually involves 
virus particles that attach to locations in insect mouthparts and are released during extended insect feeding. Most of the viruses I'll, I will be talking about today fall into this category. Understanding the transmission mode of a virus or its relatives is important. This helps us gauge how long a white fly must feed to acquire the virus from an infected plant, as well as how quickly the virus can be transmitted. For example, short probes transmit cucumber mosaic virus, a non-persistent virus, but semi-persistently transmitted viruses such as cucurbit yellow stunting disorder virus or cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus require extended and steady feeding for efficient transmission. Finally, understanding how a virus is transmitted by an insect gives us an idea of how long and how much an insect can move while carrying the virus. This can help scientists gain a better understanding of how virus transmission influences epidemiology, which is very important for developing management strategies as we have seen with the coronavirus that has been impacting our lives for the past few months. In the United States, there are three major cucurbit growing regions, the Southeast, South Texas, and the Southwest. In each of these regions, we have seen whitefly transmitted viruses emerge that have spread to other regions. If we look at a timeline, the first whitefly transmitted virus to affect cucurbit production was squash leaf curl virus, abbreviated SLCV, back in the late 1970s. SLCV emerged in California and Arizona and was eventually found in Texas in the early 1990s. Lettuce infectious yellows virus, or LIYV, was the first yellowing virus disease and was such a, a serious problem that it wiped out much of the fall cucurbit production in the southwest during the 1980s. Cucurbit leaf crumple virus, abbreviated CULCRV, was identified in the southwest and south Texas in 1998 and has moved aggressively through the south over the past several years. There is great potential that this virus could become a concern throughout the Gulf Coast region as well. Squash vein yellowing virus, or SQVYV, was identified by a colleague of mine, Scott Atkins, in Florida in the early 2000s. SQVYV has now spread extensively throughout the southeast and is now present in the southwest as well, having emerged in California in 2014 and was confirmed in Arizona last year by my laboratory. I should note, however, that the variant we have in the southwest is more closely related to an Israeli isolate than to the isolates prevalent in Florida based on comparison of viral genomes. Cucurbit yellow stunting disorder virus, or CYSDV, was first identified in the United States and South Texas in the late 1990s, but did not emerge in the southwest until 2006 when it, would, when it both appeared and devastated production throughout the Sonoran Desert production regions of California, Arizona, and Sonora, Mexico. CYSDV was identified in Florida in 2007 and is now common in the southeast as well. Finally, my laboratory identified cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus, abbreviated CCYV, in California in 2018, but ultimately determined it had been there since 2014. And I'll talk about that more in a bit. This is the first time CCYV has been found in the New World. But if the pattern we have seen continues, it will not be surprising to see this virus jump quickly to other production regions. We confirmed CCYV in Arizona last fall, but of course it has likely been there for as long as it has been in California because the production region is largely continuous. I want to take a couple minutes to talk about symptoms. Lettuce infectious yellows virus was transmitted extremely efficiently by the A biotype of Bamisa tabassi and devastated production of melons, lettuce, and sugar beet in the Imperial Valley of California, as well as the nearby Arizona production regions throughout the 1980s. The photo of yellow plants that you are looking at on the left are of lettuce showing classic symptoms of severe yellowing caused by lettuce infectious yellows virus. Melons produced a similar symptom when infected with this virus. Then over a period of about 18 months between 1990 and 1991, the virus completely vanished from the agricultural production area with the introduction and establishment of the B biotype of Bamisi tabassi, which displaced the A biotype completely. This is illustrated by the photo of healthy lettuce on the right, taken in 1992. The B biotype is extremely inefficient at transmitting lettuce infectious yellows virus. It can transmit the virus, but the transmission was so poor that the virus was not able to maintain itself 
in the field in the absence of the A biotype and therefore cannot be found in agricultural production anymore. In the 1990s, we saw the establishment and spread of the B biotype of Bermisia tabaci throughout the United States and much of the world. The B biotype can accumulate to huge numbers very rapidly, and although it eliminated the A biotype from its ecological niche, taking out LIYB with it, the B biotype brought with it the potential for transmission of an entirely new set of virus diseases. After the emergence of the B biotype and the disappearance of lettuce infectious yellows virus, Virus disease issues, although present, were considerably reduced during the 1990s. Cucurbit leaf crumple virus emerged in the late 1990s, but was not a serious issue for desert production. That all changed in 2006. Cucurbit yellow stunting disorder virus, or CYSDV, was identified nearly simultaneously by all major programs in the southwest during September of that year, and hit nearly all mel melon production in the Sonoran Desert region the first fall. The field shown was typical of that year, with all melons showing yellowing symptoms and severely decreased fruit sugar levels. I'm going to spend the next several slides telling you about how we studied the emergence and establishment of CYSTV, as this has many parallels to what we anticipate you may deal with in your area as whitefly transmitted viruses emerge there. CYSTV symptoms begin with a chlorotic model most of you can see on the melon plant in the upper left. The symptom coalesces into a more uniform intervenal chlorosis as noticed on the melon plant in the lower left and the watermelon plant, where veins are often green surrounded by yellow tissue. Symptoms usually begin near the crown of plants and progress outward along the vines, generally resembling a nutritional deficiency. CYSDV can be transmitted semi-persistently by all three of the main sweet potato whitefly populations, including Bamesia tabaci biotypes A, B, and Q, but not by non-Bamesia species such as the greenhouse whitefly. After acquisition, the virus can be transmitted for up to nine days. This is one of the longest periods of virus transmission among viruses in the genus Cranivirus, of which CYSTV is a member. Interestingly, prior to its emergence in California and to our studies, the host range of CYSTV was believed to be restricted to cultivated and wild cucurbits, but we found that the virus is actually able to infect plants in at least 11 taxonomic families, and many of these are common weeds in desert production areas. So how do we identify CYSDV or other viruses from a grower's field? First, we collect leaves, usually with symptoms, or receive a shipment from a grower or from extension. We then extract total nucleic acid, basically RNA or DNA, from the leaf tissue. This can be done from plants with or without symptoms. We then run a molecular test called RT-PCR, which makes copies of a piece of the virus genome. We can visualize the RT-PCR products by separating them on a type of gelatin using an electric current and can identify the virus based on the size of the bands produced on the gel. In this gel, you can see some of the early samples we used for detection of CYSDV back in 2006. The products of RT-PCR shown here tell us which samples have CYSDV and which do not. Lane 1 contains a DNA size marker, whereas lanes 2, 3, and 8 are melon samples that tested positive for CYSDV, as shown by the discrete bands circled in red. Lanes 4 through 7 are negative for CYSDV and contain smears and non-target bands, which occur sometimes. Lane 9 did not contain DNA. Following amplification, degenerate RT-PCR products were confirmed by sequence analysis. In order to determine the prevalence of CYSDV in the desert and the natural host range of the virus in the region, we conducted a survey of all melon fields in Imperial County, California from 2007 through 2009. With the help of Eric Natwick, an extension entomologist from Imperial County, and the Imperial County Agricultural Commissioner's Office, we identified melon field locations 
during both spring and fall seasons and sampled transects of each field, collecting yellowed leaves when available. RNA was extracted and tested using the methods just described. In the fall, results were identical for all three years. All melon fields were infected with high rates of infection in each field. CYSDV infections in spring melons increased gradually over a three-year period, but in most cases, infections developed late in the season with limited impact on the crop. This is shown in the next slide. In the spring of 2007, only one field was found with CYSDV infection, and this was in mid-June. However, in 2008, infection was first observed in early May, and by mid-June, 39% of fields showed varying levels of infection. By 2009, this number increased to 63%. Spring fields generally varied from a few plants to as much as 25% infection. Spring infections leveled off in 2010 and 2011 and have fluctuated since, depending largely on the rate of emergence of whitefly populations. An important outcome of this survey was the identification of several non-cucurbit plant species that were CYSDV hosts. This included 18 species from 10 plant families in addition to the cucurbitaceae. Host identifications were supported with laboratory transmission experiments to confirm we could infect the newly identified host under laboratory conditions. Interestingly, most of the newly identified hosts were symptomless, yet many were excellent sources for whitefly acquisition of virus and transmission to cucurbit plants. One of the few host plants that did show strong symptoms was alkali mallow, a low-growing weed from the same family as cotton that is widely prevalent along the margins of many irrigated fields. This plant produces typical foliar yellowing in laboratory transmission tests, but in the field, symptoms are much more difficult to observe. Lettuce is a moderately susceptible host, and although symptoms are difficult to identify, leaves occasionally may exhibit very mild cupping or crumpling, but there are no, no yield effects on lettuce. We examined CYSDV accumulation among seven different types of host plants and found that melon and the wild cucurbit buffalo gourd, cucurbita fetidissima, accumulated CYSDV best among the seven plant types. Lettuce and bean, two crop hosts, accumulated moderate levels of virus, as did the weeds shepherd's purse and alkali mallow. The lowest accumulation was found in alkali mallow, the plant with the interesting symptoms on the previous slide. In yet another study, we compared rates of CYSDV transmission between zucchini squash plants and several types of host plants with a goal of determining the potential of the different plant types to serve as reservoirs of the virus during periods when melons are not in the field. In these experiments, 50 to 70 whiteflies were fed for 48 hours each on CYSDV infected zucchini, followed by another 48 hours on a test plant to determine efficiency of transmission to the test plants. Reciprocal experiments were then conducted using the same approach to compare transmission from the test host back to zucchini squash. One of the things this showed is that this virus, CYSDV, really does well in cucurbits. The two cucurbit hosts, zucchini and buffalo gourd, both had high rates of transmission to and from zucchini squash as shown in the red boxes. Some host plants were fairly easily infected but were less efficient in serving as acquisition hosts for the white fly to acquire and then transmit the virus back to zucchini. This included the crop hosts, lettuce and bean, as well as two of the weed hosts, shepherd's purse and alkali mallow. London rocket a wild brassica species was an excellent reservoir host for CYSTV. All plants became infected in transmission from zucchini squash, although none developed any symptoms. Additionally, most of the zucchini became infected during transmission from London rocket, which tells us London rocket is a very good source of the virus for acquisition of virus by white flies and transmission to cucurbits in the field. 
This also shows the ability to produce symptoms has nothing to do with the ability of the virus to be a good source for transmission because London Rocket does not produce symptoms when infected with CYSTV. Finally, alfalfa, the most widely grown crop in the Imperial Valley, was unable to be infected in transmission from zucchini, even though we had confirmed infection of alfalfa in the field multiple times. This was puzzling, and we went to great lengths to obtain field-infected alfalfa that was used for transmission back to zucchini. A limited test indicated relatively efficient transmission from alfalfa as well. Alfalfa is an example of a host we need to do more work on. As I mentioned, it's the most widely grown crop in the area, and it's a perennial, so it's there in the field for many years. Although alfalfa from fields tested positive, unlike melons in the fall, not all alfalfa plants in a field are positive. The difficulty in transmitting from zucchini to alfalfa suggests some cultivar-specific resistance, but we need to do more work on that aspect. Since this experiment was conducted, we have been able to transmit to the most widely grown cultivar of alfalfa in the valley. One of the best means to control these new viruses is through the development of resistant varieties. Several sources of resistance have been identified in melon for control of CYSTV that are close to commercialization, and much of this work was developed in Imperial Valley during the fall melon season. This photo, taken by Jim McCright, a melon breeder for the USDA out of Salinas, illustrates the potential for resistance. Remember, the large populations of whitefly still necessitate insecticidal control to prevent plant death due to feeding damage, but when combined with resistance, the crop performs very well. This was an earlier photo from several years ago, and the quality and availability of resistance has improved considerably even since this impressive photo was taken. I'm going to move fairly quickly through some of the next slides as I pre present some of the other diseases you may see in watermelon and other cucurbit crops. This is cucurbit leaf crumple virus, abbreviated CULCRV. These are some photos taken by the Gilbertson lab at UC Davis. The reason we call this cucurbit leaf crumple virus is because it produces a crumpled appearance on leaves that are infected as shown on the melon leaves in the right-hand photo. But in watermelon, in addition to crumpling, the virus can produce marginal yellowing on the leaves. These symptoms are distinct from those caused by CYSDV. Cucurbit leaf crumple virus is transmitted by sweet potato whiteflies. It is a persistently transmitted virus, which means that once acquired, the virus circulates within the vector and can be transmitted for the life of the whitefly. It should be noted that symptoms of cucurbit leaf crumple virus can be observed on new growth as well as older growth. During mixed infections, one may observe CYSDV symptoms on older leaves near the crown, but cucurbit leaf crumple virus symptoms may also be apparent near the ends of vines. Some plants, particularly melon and watermelon, may recover approximately a month after infection, which can be seen with symptoms failing to develop on new growth. This is squash vein yellowing virus, or SQVYV. This is the virus that was discovered in Florida in the early 2000s but has since spread to South Carolina, Georgia, as well as to California and Arizona. Early symptoms on squash and most other cucurbits are indicated by yellowing of the veins, thus the name. Symptoms are less pronounced on melon and cucumber plants. Although these plants can become infected by squash vein yellowing virus, plants regularly recover from the symptoms. SQVYV is transmitted semi-persistently by the sweet potato whitefly, Bamisi tabassi, and infections appear predominantly limited to crops in the cucurbit family. The most important problem caused by squash vein yellowing virus occurs in watermelon and is a disease called vine decline. This disease, much like in other cucurbits, begins with yellow veins, but leads quickly to leaf and vine collapse. Watermelon fruit from squash vein yellowing virus infected plants develop rind necrosis and have decreased fruit sugars, which can occur even before complete collapse of vines. In 2014, squash vein yellowing virus emerged in melon in the desert southwest and has been found regularly in mixed infections with CYSDV 
and other viruses since that time. Interestingly, another virus, cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus, which is closely related to CYSTV and produces nearly identical symptoms, also emerged in the region at the same time, although it was not identified until 2018. A resistance trial for CYSDV had been conducted in the Imperial Valley in 2016, and results had not followed expectations, which was surprising after several years of advancement with this material. Once CCYV was identified from the field, we revisited RNA extracts from the failed resistance trial as well as other samples stored in the laboratory freezer and confirmed that cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus had not only impacted the 2016 CYSDV resistance trial, but had actually been present in the field samples as far back as 2014. Freezer samples from 2011 to 2013 tested negative, indicating introduction to the region around 2014, coinciding with the emergence of squash vein yellowing virus in the area as well. Most host range studies on cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus have been conducted in Asia and in the Mediterranean region where the virus is well established. We know a great deal less about what regional host plants may serve as reservoirs for CCYB in the U.S. desert southwest, but some of the relevant crop hosts include lettuce, spinach, alfalfa, and sugar beet, all of which are grown in the region. Symptoms are mild to non-existent on some hosts but as shown here, CCYV produces a whitening between the veins of infected lettuce, which contrasts with the exceptionally mild symptoms produced by CYSTV on lettuce. Interestingly, CCYV has been reported to infect sugar beet, but extensive sampling of sugar beet plants in the Imperial Valley where, it is, where the crop is planted in the fall while whitefly populations are high has not led to identification of CCYV infection in this crop raising questions about its importance as a host plant in the region. Beet pseudo yellows virus is a virus in the same genus, Cranivirus, as CCYV and CYSTV, but is only transmitted by the greenhouse whitefly and not by Bamesia tabassi. This virus is found in more temperate regions and in greenhouses where the whitefly is more prevalent, but is not found in low desert production regions of the southwest as the climate there is not suitable to the vector. Beet pseudo yellows virus causes foliar yellowing on cucurbit crops just like that of CCYV and CYSTV. In areas where both white flies occur, it may be necessary to consider beet pseudo yellows virus as a possible cause of yellowing symptoms as well. Like the other viruses, the earlier the infection, the more likely yield will be impacted. A side story on this virus involves a pumpkin grower I used to work with. The grower had numerous crops, including artichokes and strawberry, in addition to pumpkin, all three of which happen to be hosts of beet pseudo yellows virus. But artichoke is symptomless, and strawberry only develops disease when in mixed infections with a select set of other strawberry infecting viruses. There were also a number of brushy areas near fields, and BPYV also infects a wide range of weeds common in coastal California. Infection of pumpkin was a problem each summer and impacted the pumpkin crop. Once the grower realized his problems were related to whiteflies carrying virus that moved into other crops when artichokes were cut back after the season, he adjusted the timing of cutback, removed weeds, and was able to effectively manage beet pseudo yellows virus. In other words, a little understanding of where viruses hide out and how they move can be very important in developing effective management strategies. All right, here's your first test. What viruses would you expect if you looked at this plant based on what we've gone over so far? I'll give you a minute. Sure, this looks like a white fly transmitted yellowing virus, maybe cucurbit yellow stunting disorder virus, or cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus, maybe even beet pseudo yellows virus, but it's actually a look-alike. This is cucurbit aphid-borne yellows virus, CABYV. It is a completely different virus, transmitted by aphids, not whiteflies, and it looks identical to the whitefly transmitted yellowing viruses. This virus is not of economic concern in the U.S., but it does occur in California and likely other areas as well. 
It is easily confused with white fly transmitted yellowing viruses. In addition to cucurbit aphid borne yellows virus, aphids spread a number of other virus diseases that are not uncommon in areas also affected by white fly transmitted viruses. These include watermelon mosaic virus, cucumber mosaic virus, zucchini yellow mosaic virus, and although not pictured, squash mosaic virus. Symptoms of these viruses are distinct from those of yellowing viruses, usually showing alternating patterns of dark and light green to yellow, with some producing bubbling or bumpy symptoms on leaves or fruit. They can also occur independently from one another, but it is also not uncommon to find them together in mixed infections, as shown in the specialty melon in the lower right photos. The next few slides will give you a feel for some of these symptoms you may see as well. Cucumber mosaic virus, or CMV, is one of the most common aphid transmitted viruses. It is what virologists call a non-persistent virus, as it is transmitted during probing, when the aphid is checking out the plant and trying to determine where it wants to feed. The virus has an extensive host range and is present in most cucurbit growing regions. Watermelon mosaic virus is also quite common. It is not related to cucumber mosaic virus, but there are some similarities between symptoms produced by the two viruses on cucurbit plants. The melon plant in the photo on the left is infected with watermelon mosaic virus, or WMV, but is resistant to cucumber mosaic virus, or CMV, which was also present in the resistance trial from which I took the photo. These viruses occur together regularly in California production regions, and during the spring season, both can also be found in fields along with symptoms of CYSDV or CCYV in the low desert. Zucchini yellow mosaic virus and papaya ring spot virus are in the same genus as watermelon mosaic virus, the genus Podivirus. Both viruses can cause malformation and discoloration of fruit, leaf mosaic, and bubbling on the leaves, as well as what we call filiformity. Although filiformity is far more common with zucchini yellow mosaic than with papaya ring spot. Filiformity is where the leaf doesn't develop fully between veins and looks like fingers or as if it has been shredded. You can see some of this in the squash leaf photos on the left. Squash mosaic is relatively common in the southeastern United States and causes mosaic symptoms that are similar to those produced by other viruses I just introduced. Unlike the other viruses, squash mosaic virus is transmitted by cucumber beetles, like the one shown on the right. After being acquired during feeding, this virus is retained by the beetle for up to 20 days and can become seed-borne as well, meaning seeds from infected plants can grow into new infected plants. Mixed infections are becoming an issue for cucurbit production and breeding throughout much of the world and can complicate both disease diagnosis and production fields and breeding for virus resistance. Unfortunately, CYSDV resistant melon lines do not appear to control cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus, as I mentioned with the 2016 resistance trial. Resistance is not known for either virus in, in other cucurbits, therefore mixed infections will make resistance breeding challenging because both viruses produce nearly identical symptoms on cucurbit plants. It is also important to consider the possibility that mixed infections may influence accumulation of and resistance to CYSDV and or CCYV, as there are numerous cases with viruses closely related to these in which virus accumulation or severity of symptoms can be more pronounced during mixed infections with other types of viruses. Little information is available on this for cucurbit crops, but this should be monitored in resistance breeding studies at least until further information is available. Because it is difficult and time consuming to monitor for viruses individually, we designed a simple and reliable method to differentiate and measure the amount of each virus in plants from a single test. We use a method known as RT-PCR, which I've shown before for identification of an individual virus. But in this case, we are looking for bands of a specific size that allow us to tell which virus is present. RNA extracted from leaves of cucurbit plants, either inoculated in the laboratory 
or collected from the field is evaluated using a method known as multiplex RT-PCR. In multiplex RT-PCR, we have the ability to target each of four different viruses in a single reaction. And if a virus is present, one will see a band of a particular size when analyzing the results on a gel, as shown in the photo. In lane 5 of this photo, you can see the different sizes of bands indicating the presence of the white fly transmitted viruses CCYV, SQVYV, CYSDV, and the aphid transmitted lookalike virus Cucurbit aphid borne yellows virus. The other lanes show a combination of greenhouse and field samples and how easy it is to see which viruses are in each plant. The method was validated with field samples collected from Imperial Valley in June 2019, near the end of the spring melon season, and from throughout the desert production region last fall, with a collection trip in September and October 2019, coordinated by Bindu Pudel, an extension plant pathologist with the University of Arizona Extension at Yuma, shown holding a melon leaf. My postdoc, Sean P.S. Mondal, pictured in the striped shirt, and I, collected melon leaf samples from throughout the desert production region and analyzed them in the lab using the multiplex detection system. Here you can see two sets of samples showing a combination of individual and mixed virus infections. In gel 1, all samples are infected, infected with cucurbit yellow stunting disorder virus, or CYSDV. And some plants have mixed infections with squash vein yellowing virus or cucurbit parotic yellows virus. Gel 2 also shows a plant with a mixed infection of CCYV and squash vein yellowing virus. Cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus, or CCYV, was by far the most prevalent virus in a preliminary test of the multiplex system using plants collected from a breeding plot at the Desert Research and Extension Center in the Imperial Valley of California in June 2019. Surprisingly, CYSTV was only found in two plants in this test, and both were, all, were also infected with CCYV. In the fall of 2019, a more thorough sampling was conducted, covering representative fields from throughout the low desert production region. In contrast to the spring, CYSTV was now the predominant virus present in all areas. Cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus and squash vein yellowing virus were found in mixed infections with CYSTV, and in some cases, all three viruses were present in the same plant. A small number of plants with C uh, cucurbit aphid borne yellows virus infection were found near Yuma. This illustrates the efficiency of using a multiplex detection system for rapid identification and differentiation of viruses. This brings me to the final portion of this presentation. We are familiar with the distribution of white fly transmitted viruses in the southwest, the southeast, and for the most part, south Texas, but no one has examined incidence of these viruses along the Gulf Coast states of Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Through the support of the National Watermelon Association, we will be sampling watermelon fields and fields of other cucurbit crops throughout the region. These will be tested for the presence of white fly transmitted viruses, and along with this, we will collect white flies and test them to determine if they are the traditional B biotype or another biotype, such as the invasive Q biotype. As we do this, we will provide grower education toward management of white fly transmitted viruses through programs like the one you are watching today. Our goal is to better understand the threats to watermelon production from these viruses and provide recommendations to improve management based on regional risk. This image from the USDA National Agricultural Statistics Service illustrates watermelon acreage throughout the region. Production is scattered fairly evenly throughout the region, but Alabama and Mississippi each have areas of concentrated production as shown by counties highlighted in light and dark green. Unfortunately, we have been forced to adjust our sampling protocol based on current travel limitations and social distancing due to the COVID-19 situation. I had originally planned to visit a number of fields in person this summer to get a feel for regional production 
and have the opportunity to talk directly with growers. But this will not be possible in 2019, thanks to the epidemic. Samples will be collected by grower collaborators and extension personnel when observed or during late production season to allow for full development of infections. There is a link to the grower collaborator site on the slide. Extension personnel will ship samples to the USDA ARS for testing. The USDA ARS will evaluate for all major viruses, cucurbit yellow stunning disorder virus, cucurbit chlorotic yellows virus, squash fan yellowing virus, beet pseudo yellows virus, cucurbit leaf crumple virus, and the lookalike virus, cucurbit aphid borne yellows virus. Results will determine the presence of these viruses in sample regions. We had planned to selectively collect whiteflies as well to determine whitefly species and biotype, but this may be delayed until fall or perhaps even until next year as whitefly sampling is more challenging than providing a few leaf samples. We will use the results to determine the prevalence and threat from each virus and which vectors are impacting cucurbit crops in the region, as well as to develop risk-based management recommendations with an emphasis on integrated pest management. I'd like to conclude by acknowledging my partners on this project, Dr. Ed Sikora of Auburn University, Dr. Raj Singh of Louisiana State University, and Dr. Rebecca Melanson of Mississippi State University. Finally, I'd like to thank the National Watermelon Association for their interest in this work and for their financial support to make this project possible, as well as thanking the California Melon Research Board and the California Specialty Crop Block Grant Program for supporting development of our multiplex virus detection system, as well as all sponsors along with the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture Specialty Crop Research Initiative Cucurbit Cooperative Agricultural Project, or QCAP, for supporting portions of my postdoc, Dr. Mondal's research. A number of resources have been created in association with this project and made available to stakeholders. These are all available from the main project page on the Mississippi State University Extension website. You can access this page by visiting msuext.ms forward slash IPL6C. If you've made it this far through the video, you're already familiar with one of our resources, the presentation video. Watch it as many times as you like and share it with your friends. A fact sheet with color photos that contains much of the information discussed in this presentation is also available. Here's a quick preview. A two-page photo guide to supplement the fact sheet is also available. Watermelon and cucurbit growers in Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi who wish to volunteer to be a grower collaborator can access the link to the online grower collaborator registration from the main project webpage. You can also directly access the registration by visiting msuext.ms forward slash h27md. Again, all of these resources, the presentation video, the fact sheet, the photo guide, and the link to the Grower Collaborator registration are available to you from a single web page. That also includes the contact information for your state project leaders should you have questions or cucurbit crops suspected to be infected with one of these yellowing viruses. Thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to completing this project and reporting results to you in the future.